Okay, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, we are figuring out uh, the recording system. Um, so, on Monday, we started to talk about the set theory. And uh, we were done with um, the infinite intersection and infinite unions. So I guess uh, everyone is taking some time to review all these materials. And then towards the end of the Monday lecture, we started to talk about this concept of this disjoint, where you have two sets and they do not overlap. And we call them disjoint, okay? Now, this notion of disjoints is a fairly generic concept. What it says is the following. Let's consider two sets. This is A and this is B, okay? Now, these two sets, they do not overlap. And so if you take the intersection of A and B, you're gonna get an empty set. If this happens, we say that A and B are disjoint. Now clearly, there are many sets that are disjoint. Uh, this is one of the examples. But I can also give you another case where you have this set, A and B. Now you may wonder, why do I draw a picture like this? In fact, if you think about this diagram, you have this A, you have this B. What is this right, uh, left-hand side? Let me see. Okay. So what is the set? Yes, please. Yeah, so this is A minus B. So you want A, but you don't want B. The other side is that you want B, but you don't want A. And these two sets, by sets I mean these two sets, they are disjoint, okay? I'm not saying that A and B are disjoint. I'm saying that A minus B and B minus A, they are disjoint, okay? Regardless whether A and B, they are disjoint or not, this difference, will be disjoint. So that is the notion of disjoint. And now I'm gonna talk about something else. It's the notion of partition, okay? So now consider a sequence of sets, A1 through AN. Uh, we say that the sequence of sets, they, are, they, they form a partition of the universal set omega if you satisfy these two criteria. Number one, each individual set they are disjoint with each other. And number two, if they take the union of everyone, you're gonna get a universal set. So how do we see this? Let's draw the omega first. Okay, so now you have omega. You are going to decompose this omega into many, many small sets. And these, we call them A1 to AN. So here you have A1, A2, a3, A4, A5, and so on. Okay, so you have all these sets. These sets, they have a very interesting property that if you look at their overlaps, they do not overlap. Okay, and so we say that this collection of sets A1 through A5, they form a partition of the universal set. Okay, so let me, let me repeat it again. We say that a collection of sets, they form a partition of omega when you can cut the omega into many smaller pieces. Each piece, they do not overlap with another set. And, they, and the union of everyone, they have to cover the entire set. Okay, so, so this is called the, the, uh, the partition. Uh, there are many, many practical situations that you will form a partition. For example, if you throw a die, you naturally form a partition of six sets, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? So, so they naturally form this partition. You look at the coin flip, you'll naturally form a two partition, yes and no, okay? 
uh, you, you don't want them to overlap because if they overlap, there, there are lots of things that you cannot do. You need to take care of the overlap region. And so you want to make sure that the partition just, just craft out these sets into smaller sets um, so that they do not overlap. So that's the notion of partition here. Okay, so we'll come back to this notion partition later as we define the probability space because uh, as you can see, if you have, a, you have a gigantic events, you want to craft them into smaller events, each, each individual events, you don't want them to overlap with each other so you can have, you can have some sort of independence. So, so that's the, the reason that we're introducing this concept of partition here. Okay, so disjoint and partition and we're done. Now let's move on to talk about set operations. So this is 2.1.8 on set operations. There are a few very important set operations that we need to learn. And hopefully by the end of uh, the semester, you can really memorize uh, these set operations. They're not, that, they're not that difficult. There are only a few of those. Um, here's one. Uh, if you take A intercept B, that's going to be the same as you take B intercept A. Now that's pretty obvious, right? So this is like addition, right? Addition, the, the, the sum of two numbers, uh, whether one plus two or two plus one, of course they're the same. So this is called the commutative property of sets. Um, you have uh, A union B, that's gonna be the same as B union A. So the ordering doesn't matter. Uh, the other one is that uh, it's associative. So you take A union of bracket B union C, it's gonna be the same as A union B bracket and then union C. Same for the intersection, you're gonna get A intercept B intersect C, that's the same as A intercept B first, and then you, you intersect with C. Okay, so these are uh, pretty straightforward uh, operations. Now the following two operations may be a little bit more uh, interesting. Uh, the first one is called a distributive operation. It's all about how do you mix the union and the intersection. The first identity says, that if you take the intersection of A with B union C, it's the same as you take the union of two sets. Uh, the first one is A intersect B, the other one is A intersect C. Uh, you can also flip around the order of the union and intersection. In this, this case, you take the intersection of B and C first, and then you take the union outside. That's gonna be the same as you take the intersection of these two subsets. Uh, one is A union B, the other one is A union C. Okay, so this is called a distributed property. So how do we visualize this? So I went to our office and I took these ancient things. I thought they are in the museum already, but I found them. So let's do a simple experiment here. Okay, so um, this is called uh, A, this is B, this is C, okay? So what do we want? Uh, we want to look at uh, A intercept B union C, okay? So let's do B union C. What is B union C? Okay, so let's do B union C. So B union C, first you have to take the B, and then you take the, take the C. So is it going to be the, the sum of these two circles, or is it going to be the half moon? Is it going to be the intersection? What, what, what will it be? Any, any thought? Yes. Both full circles, do you agree? Do you agree? Okay, full circles. So take this B. Okay, so this is B. And then I'm gonna take this C. Okay, so this is B union C. Everyone following me? Okay. So B union C. Okay, so this is what we want. Now, let me erase it uh, for now, and then we can come back to this point later, okay? So B union C, remember this picture, okay? B union C. Now, let's go to here. Uh, you want B union C, right? And then you have this A intersection, A intersection of B union C. Oh, actually I should, I should keep it. So you have this um, B union C, and let's also do an A. So this is my A. And the A should be here. Right, so this is my A. 
Okay, so uh, A, A intersect with B and C. So where are they? This little funny area. Okay, do you see that? It's this little funny area. So now let me then pull this out. Right, so it will be this little funny area that's going to overlap with that. Okay, it will be here. So that is the left hand side of our equation. This is the left hand side. A intercept B union C. Okay, so now let's do the right hand side. The first thing I need to do is that I need to look at what? A intercept B. Okay, A intercept B. And let's see what it is. So A intercept B will give me. What? Is it the, the sum of these two circles? Hmm. A intercept B. Okay, what is it? It should be the little area in the middle. Okay, so it should be this. This is A intercept B. And how about the other guy? The other guy is uh, A intercept C. So let me draw it. So this is A intercept C, so it should be uh, a and C here, right? So you, you get this point. Okay, so you have A intercept B and A intercept C. So let me overlap the two. Okay, now what should be the union? The union should be not the middle, but it's actually the sum of these two. Okay, and that's the same as we just drew this diagram for, for A intercept B union C. So that's the same. Um, so you can repeat the same exercise for the other distributed property, right? So you can, you can repeat this exercise for this A uh, union of B intersect C and A union B intersect A union C. You can, you can repeat this exercise at home, okay? Um, you can even just draw on a paper. You don't need to go to a museum and find these two, to do the transparencies out, okay? Okay, so, so this is the distributed property. Um, now let's talk about the De Morgan's law. This is the uh, the next one. So this theorem says that if you take uh, a intercept b, you take a complement outside. Okay, you take a complement outside. You're going to take the union of the two complements. Now, if you flip the sign around, let's say you take the union of a and b, then that's going to become the intersection. That's going to become the intersection. So how do we do that? Again, let me just draw this diagram here to illustrate the idea. So let's say we have A and B. So this is A and this is B. Okay, A and B. Uh, and because I need to overlap, so I need to make sure that uh, the circles are the same, so I need to draw this again. So I have this A, I have this B. Okay, so the, the first one is a intercept B and then the complement. A intercept B and then the complement. Now, in order to show the complement, of course, I need to draw the, uh, the, the, the omega. So A, A intercept B's complement. Now, what, where is A intercept B? A intercept B is in the middle. It's here. So what is this complement? It will be anything outside this intersection. So it has to be this. So everywhere, okay, except this little thing. So that is called the A intercept B complement, okay? Now, how about the right-hand side? This is A complement union B complement, okay? So now, where is A complement? The A complement, okay, so let's draw this thing first. So this is, remember this diagram, okay? So, so let's draw the A complement. The A complement, it would be anything that is outside A, and that has to be here. This is A, right? So this is your A complement, okay? Now, how about your B complement? I guess you will agree with B that the B complement will just be anything that is outside the B, which will be here. 
Okay, so this is your B complement. Let me draw the circle to make sure that we understand. This is the B complement. You want everything outside the B. Now let's take the overlap. What do we have? Okay, you, you, you want A intercept B's complement. Okay, A intercept B's complement. That is on the left hand side of the equation. That is on the left hand side of the equation, right? A intercept B's complement. And then on the right hand side of this equation, you say this is A complement union and B complement. So you have uh, A complement union with B complement. So it's going to be any, any uh, region that has at least one color. So it has to be uh, this and this and that without the centerpiece. So that is going to be your, your left hand side. Uh, right hand side will be A complement union B complement. Okay, so you can do this um, mapping. So once you have all these formulas in, in hand, uh, doing the problems will be, will be fairly straightforward. All operations about the sets is based on what? Union, intersection, and complement. And how do we solve these problems? Um, grab a piece of paper, start to draw things like that. Then you will be able to answer most of the questions. Now, as for proving things, um, I would say that once you understand what this picture is talking about, it, it, it's really just translating the picture to the paper by writing the equations down. Okay? So, so if you really un understand what's going on with these pictures, you should be okay uh, with, with, the, with the proofs. All right, so that concludes the section on uh, set theory. I guess we, we know all the basic tools. Uh, we're not going to do a lot of complicated things, but at least uh, bear in mind some of the basic operations should be there. So as you are working on different problems, as you are doing the actual problems that your boss is going to give you later on in your career, you at least have, you at least have some tools uh, to, to, to use. Okay, any questions so far for the set theory? This is uh, section 2.1. Yes, please. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for this class, I'm not going to test you proving things in the exam. Okay, um, and just because not everyone has the proof fluency uh, in, in this course, no, we, we're, not, we're not math major. Although uh, I would say 10 years ago, we would ask the students to prove. Um, uh, nowadays, uh, if you see the problem, um, just draw a picture. You draw a picture, explain it. Uh, I think that would be enough uh, for this course. OK. <clears throat> OK, any other questions? OK, good. So if no question, let's move on. So this is lecture 2.2, uh, basically chapter 2.2. And this chapter is about probability space. And this is really a, um, a abstract, it's the, one of the most abstract uh, lectures over the entire semester. Um, we're not going to use STEM um, um, as we are working on real problems. Uh, you will know what I'm talking about as you are moving on to your career. Uh, it's something that is always good to know, but you don't really need them uh, as you work on problems. Uh, uh, the reason we're introducing this probability space because well, what is probability? Right? So if you, if you go out and somebody asks you, ah, can you, can you give me a 10 minute summary of probability? Then, uh, of course we need to tell people what is probability. Uh, so this lecture is meant to give you the, the mathematical rigor uh, or the foundation of the probability uh, so that we can build things on top of those. As we are moving on to actually sit down and programming Python and then doing MATLAB, you, you don't need to go back to the axioms. Uh, it's not going to help you solve those actual problems. Okay? Uh, however, uh, it's good to know. It's really, really good to, it's really, really important to understand. Um, if you do research uh, in signal processing, statistical signal processing, machine learning, then you need to go back to all these to define the proper measure space uh, and, and to prove things. Okay, so without further ado, let's talk about the thing. Um, probability space. What makes a probability space? There are three things, okay, three things. 
One is called the sample space, the other one is called the event space, and then the third one is called the, the law, okay, the probability law. So you need, you need these three things to construct this abstract notion of probability. Okay, so what is probability? The probability is a number. It's a number, very simple, it's a number. It's a number between zero and one, okay? It is always the probability of an event. Probability can be objective. For example, you, you throw a die, you flip a coin, this is very objective, okay? You can count the frequency and then you imagine that you're gonna flip the coin infinitely many times, then half of the chance that you're gonna get a head, half of the chance that you're gonna get a tail. So this is the frequentist approach of looking at the thing as the events, as the number of experiments goes to infinity. Now, there is also a notion of subjective probability. For example, will you get an A in this class? This is very subjective. And do you want to take the frequentist approach of doing this experiment 10,000 times to verify that your probability of passing this class is 0.8? Now, you're welcome to do that. You just retake this course over and over, over and over. Um, every semester, you just enroll the same class. And then over the period of time, then you can prove that as, as the experiment goes to infinity, you will get 0.7 probability. Then you can do that, but no one's gonna do it, right? So there's always a subjective uh, perspective of probability, which is going to be extremely useful, and that's also called the Bayesian probability, that you have some prior belief or some prior knowledge that you want to inject into uh, the problem. Uh, we do use uh, Bayesian uh, subjectivity very often. For example, when we do image processing, we know that the images, uh, they, are, they are mostly smooth, except at those boundaries, you have some sharp changes. Now those can be learned through data, machine learning, whatever, uh, and those what we call, uh, what we call the, the prior distribution of the, the data. So those are, those are not coming from the actual measurement. So if I take a picture of a, uh, I turn off the light, take a picture, it's very noisy. That is coming from the physics. Very noisy, you have corrupt measurements, and there's a formula to describe that. But I say, look, I want to recover the image because I'm taking a picture of a chair. I know the shape of a chair. And so the, if you see any, any, any uh, horizontal line, it got to be some edges of the chair. And so this is your prior belief that you want to inject into the problem. There's always the likelihood term. There's always a prior term. You want to put them together uh, to make inference. Okay, so the Bayesian, also the, the, the frequencies, they're complementary to each other. We'll come back to this point later of the semester, but for now, let's just remember that probability can be both objective and also subjective. Probability itself is just a number. It's a number between zero and one, and it's always about an event. What, is, what do I mean by an event? Uh, when you measure the probability, for example, of, uh, of a coin, uh, you're always saying that what is the probability of getting a head or a tail. Now this head or the tail, it is an event. I can construct another event, it's called the head or tail. Okay, because what is an event? Event is just a set. The union of two sets is another set. A set can be an event, right? So I can say, what is the probability of getting a head or a tail? Of course, that's one, okay? But you can ask that. I can ask, what is the probability of getting a head event or, uh, and a, a tail event, that's an empty set, so the probability will be zero. So it's always about a set, okay? It's always about an event. So the probability of getting ahead, of course, is half. It is a fair game. Um, there's also another uh, uh, very important concept here. Uh, what is probability? I mentioned last time, okay? Probability, of course, is a number, it's measured an event. Event is a set, okay? It's a set, therefore the probability is a measure of the size of the set relative to the universal space or the sample space. Okay, it's always measuring the size of something. When you think about this measuring the size of something, it can be anything. It doesn't need to be throwing a, throwing a die, it can be measuring the volume of water, you can measure the, the time duration, right? You can measure the, the, the frequency, you can measure many things. 
uh, and therefore the, the, the probability is always applied to a set, okay, a set, which is an event. This is a, a pictorial illustration of everything we need to know uh, in probabilistic analysis. You always start with an experiment, okay, so this is uh, a, a chemical experiment, a physics experiment, biological experiment, or if you do data science, you, you collect data. You ask people for opinion. You go to Facebook, you hack into Facebook, you get the data. Uh, recommendation system, this is how Google find, finds your, 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 your purchase uh, um, uh, preference. Uh, it's, it's not hacking, but it's collecting the information without getting your agreement and whatever, okay? Um, so, so this is an experiment. You go there and collect the data. Um, now, uh, as you go to uh, this uh, thing in the middle, uh, you're going to have the sample space. This sample space is a collection of all the possible outcomes. If you throw a die, it will be one through six. So if a coin, one or two, right, uh, uh, zero or one, uh, if, if you say, okay, I'm going to um, uh, 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 take a test between zero and 100, so you get a zero and 100. Right? So this is the sample space that contains all the possible outcomes. Outcomes that are individual elements. Then within the sample space, you can see that there are, there are little sets. These are subsets inside the sample space. Now sample space is a set. Inside the sample space, you can always craft out subsets. Okay, you can, you can craft out a lot of subsets. Those subsets, they are called the events. Okay, they are called the events. Now for every event, you can map the events to these little bars. Okay, in our language, we call them the histogram. Okay, but in, in, in this probability model, uh, we call them the uh, probability mass for discrete random variables. Okay? So this is called the, 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 uh, the, the numbers. So you have this probability model, and there's a mapping. This mapping from events to a number, that's called the probability law. Okay, so you have sample space, events, and there's a law. There's a law, it's a mapping from an event to a number. Now you can assign this number. You may say, okay, if I flip a coin, it got to be half. Well, that's your assignment of flipping a fair coin to be one half. Now you don't have to get a fair coin. You can say, I have an unfair coin, uh, 0.9 versus 0.1. Uh, you can do that, and that assignment will be 0.9 will go to the head, 0.1 will go to the tail. So that is the assignment that you can construct uh, into this probability law. Now there are rules for you to follow. You cannot say, uh, I, have, I have a fair coin and then uh, the probability of getting a head is 0. 0.7, the, the probability of getting a tail is 0. 0.5. Now that, that is not allowed because the sum of these two got to be one. Right? So you, you, you have constraints. You can't arbitrarily assign the rules. Okay? So you need to follow some kind of things, uh, rules we call the axioms. Okay, so that would be the next chapter, chapter 2.3. Uh, we need to talk about those axioms. What are the constraints that you need to follow? Uh, and so once you have those, uh, you have constructed the probability space that contains these three things, uh, then you're done. As far as this abstraction of the event, is, that's done. Then the rest is state analysis. Okay, you, you come up with a model, random variable, the random variable is going to apply to the data, you're going to fit the data, and then you're going to make prediction, that's, that's the next thing, okay? But what we're doing here is to understand what's going on in this basic foundation. That is the, the purpose of this, uh, this lecture. So what is uh, sample space? The sample space, as I said, is just a collection of all the possible outcomes, okay? So sample space omega. Is the collection of all possible outcomes, and we denote this omega as an element in this uh, omega, big omega set. If you flip a coin, uh, you get head or tail. If you throw a dice, you get one, two, three, uh, four, five, six. Um, waiting time for the bus in West Lafayette. Uh, that's always a good question. Uh, what do you want? Uh, it's never going to be zero minute, right? Uh, T uh, um, bigger than what? Give me a number. 30 minutes? Okay, somebody really hate West Lafayette bus. Okay, how about the upper bound? 45 minutes? Oh, so, so that's, that's upper bounded. Okay, okay, that's good. It's, at least it's, it's upper bounded. 
So someone suggests that this is the uh, waiting time of a bus in West Lafayette. So this is a set. Okay, so this is a this is a sample space. So now we can ask an event: What is the probability that the bus will come between um, 32 minutes and 33 minutes? So we can define this event, right? I guess this is the the purpose here. Okay, so we have defined the sample space. Now. Um, the sample space, as you can see here, the sample space can contain discrete numbers, including a die, flipping coin. Uh, it can contain continuous intervals, uh, for example, the time we just talked about. Uh, we can also talk about uh, the sample space of all the functions, uh, what we showed last time, where you have all the sine functions, cosine functions, strict lines. Uh, so that would be the sample space of all the functions. Okay, so sample space is fairly straightforward. Uh, now let's talk about the event space. Okay, so what is an event space? You go back to the sample space, you look at all the possible points in the event space, you're gonna form little subsets inside the sample space, right? So remember, sample space is a big set, it's a big, 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 big uh, set. Inside this big set, you can always construct smaller subsets. Okay, so they're smaller subsets, they are not necessarily elements, okay? It, it can be an element, so the subset can contain only one element, the subset can contain two elements. The subset can also be empty, right? So, so uh, just think about that, it's, it can be a, um, inside the sample space, there will be many, many subsets, okay? The subsets can be big, can be small. These subsets are called the events. So inside big subs, uh, the sample space, there are many, many small events. The difference between an outcome and event, an outcome is an element in the sample space. An event is a subset in the sample space. You see the difference? Okay, so here is a dot. This is a set that contains one dot. Now that's a difference between the two. This is a number, this is a set. So let's see. If you throw a die, uh, the sample space is one to six. You can define the event as even numbers. So you have two, four, and six. So this is a set that contains three numbers. Uh, it will be, uh, another example, it will be less than three, not, not including three, so that will be another subset, one and two. I can take, uh, F3, which is F1, intercept F2. I can do that. It's another subset inside the sample space, it's allowed. That is going to give me what? Yes, please. It is, you are very careful, okay? You know I'm gonna trick you, okay? So it's going to be a set that contains a number two. It is not a two, it is a set that contains the number two. That is called an event. If you only write down a two, that is a number, that is an element in the sample space. So that is an event, that is an outcome. Uh, if you wait a bus, uh, this is an example between zero and 30, uh, you can define uh, F1 to be between zero and 10, including zero. F2 is uh, between a, a zero and five and a 20 and 30. You can take the union, so these are possible events that you can construct inside uh, the sample space. Now, when you have all these events, you can construct a, a collection of all the events. Now, this is getting even worse, okay? All right, so now you think about that. Now, you have a sample space. You have many, many points. Those are called the elements, okay? Many, many elements. And then you can form subsets inside the sample space. So this is subsets, right, subsets. Now I'm gonna look at the collection of all the subsets. The collection of all subsets. Now what are they? Um, this is one subset. This is another subset. That can be another subset. That can be another subset. That can be the subset. So it will be a collection of all the possible subsets. You ask, how many are there? Uh, that's a lot, but, 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 but you know it exists, okay? Mathematicians, okay? Uh, it exists. All right, so, so you see, there are many, 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 just, just many, many uh, 
uh, uh, of these subsets. Yes, question? Okay, so the question is then what is event space, right? So what is event space? The event space is a gigantic set that contains many, many small subsets. All these subsets, they all come from here. Okay, it's a collection of all the possible subsets that you can, you can ever construct from this event uh, the sample space. Let, let me give you some concrete examples, otherwise everyone's gonna, gonna, gonna cry, okay? So, uh, 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 flip a coin, okay, as simple as that, flip a coin. Uh, flip a coin and then throw a die. Uh, so, so let's do something easy. Uh, so you can have a coin, okay? Uh, what are the uh, sample space? Head or tail? Okay, so this is, this is the sample space. Omega equals to head or tail. A sample space that contains two elements. Okay, so without talking about the sample space, let's just write down all the possible subsets that you can ever construct in the sample space. Now I can easily construct two. A set that contains the head, a set that contains the tail. I have two, but there are two more, there are two more. But at least I think we will agree that these two are the um, um, possible, uh, these are two the subs, uh, subsets I can construct. What are the other two? Okay, so we can, how about we take an or, we can take an or, or will be H or T, head or tail. Now what is head, uh, uh, this set, right? Uh, or tail, right? It, it will be one subset union with the other subset. Uh, what, 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 what is that set? Omega. You guys following me? Okay, so this is the sample, sample space. So you have uh, omega. Now uh, you can also take uh, H intersect with T, one set intersect with the other set, what do we get? Empty set, so we have an empty set. Okay, so now I can construct empty set, a set contains head, a set contains tail, and the sample, uh, the sample space. So I have at least four. Uh, how about complement? I say that any set operation can be constructed with complement. Uh, what is the complement of, of head? Tail, what is the complement of tail? Head. Uh, what is the complement of head and tail? Head and tail is empty set, the complement is sample, sample space. What is the complement of a head or tail? It will be, uh, head or tail will be sample space, you go back to the empty set. You're not gonna go outside, okay? See, that is very, very magical, you cannot go outside. And you take, you take, um, uh, uh, you take this, uh, this set, uh, you take the uh, uh, omega minus t, that's gonna give you h. You take the complement, you get back to t. So, so every, all these operations, no matter how you do them, it's gonna fall inside this uh, the set, okay? So now I'm gonna construct a bigger set. Okay, I'm gonna construct a, a set that contains set. Okay, now that's complicated, that's really, really complicated. It's like you wanna trick somebody. You buy them, you go, you go to some store, you buy a box, and the inside box you put another box, inside the box you put another box. So this is a set of a set. Uh, so you have a set, inside the set you have, you have four uh, subsets. Now remember, this is a set, this is also a set, this is called an empty set, this is not zero. This is called an empty set. The size of the set is zero, but this, this, set, this subset is not zero. This set is an empty set. This is a set that contains uh, everything, so the sample space. Uh, so you have this, 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 and that. And this is called the, the sample space. This is called a sample space. Now what is probability law then? The probability law is not applied to individual elements. The probability law is going to be applied to these events, right? So I'm gonna look at what is the probability of getting um, a head or tail. Now this is a head or tail course here, but it's this event called head or tail. And so I'll give you a number of one because the probability law is going to map this event called head or tail to the number one. 
Right? So probability law is never trying to just map, map head to a number, tail to a number. That's, that's called the other thing. That's called the random variable. That's called a map an outcome to a, 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 a number. Okay? So, so, so the probability law is going to take anything inside this F, it's called the uh, sample space, and then map it to a number between 0 and 1. So how about um, uh, throwing a die? Okay, throwing a die. Uh, now you have six numbers. Ah, that's complicated. Yes, please. Yes. Mm -hmm. The sample space contains H and T. Yeah, so this is called the event space. All right, this is called the sample space. Yes, question. It, it, it got to be. Should, should a sample space always be inside the event space? It has to be, because otherwise you cannot, you cannot cover uh, the set of everyone. So it got to be inside. Okay, good. So, um, event space for uh, 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 throwing a die. So you have one, two, six. Now that combination is a little bit not as easy, but we know it exists. Okay, I think that's, that's enough, right? So we know there exists uh, an event space that can take care of all the possible events that you can ever construct, including, um, one, two, three, or uh, one and two, uh, or uh, less than three or less than five even numbers, they can always be captured by this event space. So uh, if you have elements in the sample space, a discrete number of elements, how many events can you construct? Now you can, you can do this operation. Let's say you have three. You can always do a one, uh, the red and green and blue and uh, red, green, uh, green, blue and blue, red and red and green and blue and, and the empty set. So uh, how many of those are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have three outcomes. There are eight events. How do you go from two to eight? Two to the power three. Okay, so this is two to the power three. Uh, so if I have, if I throw a die, how many possible events that I can construct? It will be two to the power six. Not many. Okay, uh, but if I have um, uh, ten numbers, it will be two to the power ten. Twenty numbers, two to the power twenty. Uh, if I have too many, a thousand numbers, it will be two to the power of a thousand. Okay, still fine, right? it exists. Okay, so we, we know that uh, it's gonna be a very, very big sample space, uh, uh, event space, but, but it's there. Okay, uh, sigma field, we, uh, uh, we can skip that. Basically what it, it says is that um, if, if you take um, any set operation inside the event space, it gotta still be inside. Okay, for example, you take, if you take an um, a event F in this uh, collection of uh, events, the complement has to be inside. If you take um, a, a sequence of events that inside this event space, the, the intersection has to be inside and also the union has to be inside. So no matter what you do, uh, these three basic operations they always has to be inside. And that's called the closedness of this uh, uh, event space. Uh, this is optional. Uh, you only need to worry about that uh, when you go to a graduate school, when you really need to uh, learn the, uh, those uh, uh, probability theory. Okay, so um, as we come back on uh, Friday, we're going to talk about this um, probability law. Okay, so probability law will be, uh, it will be assignment from the events to the number. So we're going to talk about those, and then we're going to talk about um, those uh, uh, axioms. Okay, so I'll see you uh, next lecture.